recently I emphasized how that the home is the basic unit of any society. And most people, I think, are aware of the fact that a home, as God would have it, begins with marriage as the Bible defines that marriage. That's important to understand. Many things are called marriage today that the Bible does not recognize as acceptable to God. Today I would like for us to emphasize this point, that only a God-joined marriage is honorable. Do you want your marriage to be honorable? Well, the Lord's church in upholding the truth that it teaches about marriage is upholding an honorable marriage. So we want to look at things in this sermon that defined what I call a God-joined honorable marriage. And marriage is honorable when, number one, God says it's honorable. And number two, it respects the authoritative teaching of the Bible concerning marriage. And number three, it is not used to strive to legitimatize adultery. Now, our text I'm using is a familiar one to Bible students. Chapter 13 of the book of Hebrews, the inspired writer simply says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now it seems to me that's quite plain, that it doesn't really need a lot of def definition. But I would like for us to consider what is said in the text. First of all, there is such a thing as an honorable marriage. And next of all, in contrast, God considers anything that is not honorable to be in a state of fornication and fornication that involves one spouse with either another spouse in a different marriage or else a single person is called adultery. That's how that a marriage that is an honorable marriage, a God-joined marriage, is perverted or adulterated. So a line's been drawn, if you want to call it this, in the sand in our society today. And this line is pertaining to the institution of marriage as it's set out and defined and explained and taught in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. I could stop here, and for most everybody in this audience, you would recognize that marriage is a mess, and because of that, homes, to a great extent because of that, homes are a mess. So little is done today in those areas that respect the authority of God to regulate those things or to make them possible. So this is an issue that affects everyone as much as abortion or homosexuality or this transgender stuff and so on, you can add to that, does today. And we must realize that as we, as I think I said last week in one of the sermons, strive to carry out our responsibility to preach the gospel to every creature, we might as well get ready to face these things when we try to study the Bible with them. That's hard enough. Just get people interested enough in God and the Bible to have a Bible study these days. But if you do, you might as well expect to deal with such as this when every other marriage is ending in divorce. And when you will have marriages that are not honorable marriages. 
and when you will have people living as if they were married when they're not. So I would like for us today to look at marriage and, and notice when marriage is honorable. I said earlier that it's honorable when God says it's honorable. Marriage is not something of man. It's for man, but it's of God for the good of man. Therefore, he regulates it. He determines who is married. He joins a man and woman who are qualified to marry in the bonds of holy matrimony. It is a holy institution. Now, as I look back to the origin of things in the book of Genesis and read what the inspired Moses wrote in Genesis 1 and verse 27, chapter 5 and verse 2, I see then that it was God who ordained marriage, who started marriage. Notice that was done in the beginning. Now, God tolerated some things in the law of Moses and even in patriarchy, that he allowed to stand for a while, but when the full will of God through Christ was set up, then he went back to the way he started marriage in the first place. And when you look at Jesus' teaching in Matthew 19, and 4 and 5, verses 4 and 5, chapter and verse 6, you see then that Jesus doesn't teach anything new but he simply goes back to the beginning. In effect, he's restoring what started in the beginning through God's authority. It must be understood then that the laws of the land do not determine what is or is not marriage. If the laws of the land are what they ought to be, civil law, then they will be in harmony with the teaching of God in the Bible concerning what a marriage is, an honorable marriage, and so on. Let me emphasize again, and this covers everything when it comes to serving God in any matter. God's standard always prevails over the opinions or the ideas or the whims of men. That's been so for a long time since the beginning of time. Under the law, we find this in Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 8. Ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day. Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. You know, that's never been condoned by God. Whether it's the patriarchal age or the mosaical age for the Jews or us today under the authority of Christ. Again in Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 18, Moses said, When thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep all his commandments which I command thee this day, to do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord thy God. Many years ago, well over 30, I was dealing with some brethren, and several of us were, who were trying to say that the law of the land trumped the law of God. I wrote a whole series of articles at that time dealing with it. But we would talk about in the eyes of the Lord, this and that or the other is so. And they got all upset because we used the terminology in the eyes of the Lord. We weren't talking about in the eyes of civil government. We weren't talking about in the eyes of some religious institution. We use biblical terminology. In the eyes of the Lord, this is the way that it is. And yet they ridiculed in the eyes of the Lord, but they represented themselves as knowing the words of the Bible. Well, have you ever noticed how many times the terminology of what is right in the eyes of the Lord thy God is used to impress upon us? It's His will that overrides everybody else's where there is a contradiction or a disagreement. In Proverbs chapter 2 and, or 21, in verse 2, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the heart. 
I think we see that even in our country today. We are so oriented to voting on everything and the majority ruling, and that's what makes things right, that God must accept it, but he doesn't. God looks at the inward man and the motive and the intentions, but the motive and intentions of every one of us must be to do the Lord's will in whatever the subject is we're dealing with. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 25, we're familiar with this one. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That ought to be a frightening one to every one of us. Because each one of us may find it rather hard not to be biased for the things we're really involved in and like. And that can be very dangerous because the devil knows that. And he can use that against us when it comes to our obedience strictly and only to his will. In Proverbs 30 and verse 12, there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Well, that seems to me as accurate in describing America as anything could and for the most part of the world. In Acts 5 and verse 29, we now come to the New Testament. That same sentiment is expressed when the apostles were taught to no longer preach in the name of Jesus. And they simply summed it all up by saying we ought to obey God rather than men. And that, of course, should be the guiding light of every person who wants to be faithful. The honorable marriage also respects God's authority in the Word of God that deals with marriage. So what is the divine teaching that's concerning marriage? Well, again, I tell you, it all starts back at the beginning. And I want to say this regarding teaching people, trying to convert them, having Bible studies with them, trying to get them to understand how to rightly divide the word of truth or handle it right, 2 Timothy 2.15 as they study. Because, frankly, most people just don't know how. And too many in the church are that way. It's not by accident that in the very beginning you have marriage and the home discussed. And then Jesus in Matthew 19, referring all the way back to the beginning, to talk about what was said there. In verse 18 of Genesis chapter 2, the scripture reads, and the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. That means a help suitable for him. Now, I said in class this morning, we need to think about that. Out of all the things created and God saying they were good, there was not anything out of all creation that would be a suitable help for Adam. So, and out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And he goes on down and tells about the other things. But it says at the end of verse 20, but for Adam there was not found in help, meat or suitable for him. Out of all the creation. Adam can name every one of them, and God allowed those names to stand. And by the way, have you ever, ever thought about the power of the mind of a man to be able to call all of those things by their specific names, however many they were created? But that tends to tell you the power of the brain is God gave it before sin corrupted a lot of things. Going on with our study, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, which literally is a womb man, and brought her unto the man. Now, I think you have to say the next verse is how thankful Adam was for that, 
And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. I wonder in the rearing of our children, if mama sat down with their daughters and explained why you're here, what God expects of you, and the same concerning the little boys when they grow up, become men, become husbands, and then the women growing into womanhood and becoming a wife. None of this would be except that God made it that way, but we're creatures with free moral agency, and we can accept these things and the teaching of God on marriage and the home, or we can reject them. It's all up to us. Therefore, verse 24, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Well, that pretty well tells us that number one, the honorable marriage is composed of humans. Nobody else, no thing else. Not a human and a duck or a hippopotamus or a fence post, or a tree, or some other non-human. But more than that, humans come in two kinds, and that's all. I don't care what other people say, male and female. Number one, humans. Honorable marriage involves humans. It involves male and female humans. It involves adult male and fe female humans. And it's one man and one woman, not several men and one, one woman, or several women and one man. It's one man and one woman. And they're married as husband and wife. And the rest of the Bible teaches us in many places the obligations of the husband of the wife and the wife to the husband so that home will remain honorable. And we have to go elsewhere to see who is the head of that home and the duties of the head of that home and the duties he has toward his wife and what it is to be a godly wife and their duties to him and the disposition of mine each should have one toward another in an institution that they did not create and they have no right to alter. They simply have the obligation before God to keep it as God revealed it in the Word. That's the honorable marriage. So there is a leaving of parents by husband and wife and a cleaving together to make a new home in marriage, as I've described it briefly. And what comes out of this is there's no shame in the sexual union in this state long time now, shame has been something that people in America is losing. I've seen a number of articles over the years and, and sermons preached to where America doesn't blush anymore. They see every corrupted mess under the sun, a lot of it over television, certainly a lot of it over the Internet. It began even with the printed page, and there's always been pornography. <laughs> But there's no shame in the sexual union and an honorable marriage. That's what we read about a while ago in Hebrews 13. Marriage in the bed is undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Now the question to ask, are we to keep that authoritative teaching of the Bible today? Certainly we must. We don't allow anything to be changed in it. That's the way it's going to be, whether you're ethnic Chinese or Indonesian or Philippines or Russian, American, Japanese. It doesn't make any difference. When you go into a country to deliver the gospel in its pureness to them, you're going to teach on marriage. And yes, we'll get to it later, divorce and remarriage. And you're going to teach the word of God. Remember, Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. Well, does the word of God cover any of this? What have we been reading this morning? We've been reading the word of God. Now, is this teaching, this authoritative teaching still active today? 
All you got to do is do what I did a little while ago and refer you to Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. And Jesus himself, as Matthew by inspiration recorded it in writing part of the New Testament, refers us back to what I've just read in Genesis 2, 18 through 25. Paul even deals with that to, and applied to another situation in the first Corinthian epistle in chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. It simply points out that while the home is the basic unit of society and what the Bible has to say about husbands and wives and responsibility to one another and as parents to their children and the children's responsibility to their parents so that they can be brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, it makes it very clear that you don't tamper with these things. That means that when we try to teach the gospel to those outside of Christ, lost in sin, by that sin separated from God, and that's what we mean, lost in sin, they're going to have to examine their lives, and they're going to have to examine their marriages. There's something wrong with somebody calling himself a preacher of the gospel or those calling themselves faithful shepherds of the flock who will not see to it that men and women who call themselves married that they are truly in an honorable marriage and what it takes to have an honorable marriage. So what happens when we don't respect this teaching, to be obedient to it in all that it teaches? Well, you have what we have happening today in America. People laugh at marriage, don't think it's necessary. They live in a state of fornication or they commit adultery right and left. No one really thinks that much about it. And yet, in cases like that, they're hurting themselves. There's great hurt involved between themselves and all involved therein. And look what it does to the children. You have men marrying men and women marrying women. Now, understand, I use marriage there in an accommodative way. They're not married by God. Two men say we're going to be in a homosexual marriage that's not an honorable marriage because it's not according to the teaching of Jesus Christ in the Bible. Our two women decide to do the same thing. Are women marrying women? Are adults marrying children? Are multiple marriage partners, both men and women? Some people will talk about an open marriage where they just go and really commit fornication or adultery with anybody they want to and they still stay in a legal marriage situation. So you have all sorts of things that men call marriages. But there's only one God joined and honored marriage. Really what we're saying here is that anything goes if we don't abide by the objective standard that teaches God's will concerning what an honorable marriage is. Now, I realize you can be in an honorable marriage in that it is authorized by God, and then in that marriage, husband and wives not treat one another like the Bible says they should, or they don't raise their children, the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and so forth. And that's bad. That's sin on another level. But now, we'll notice this more in a minute, there's only one reason besides death that a marriage should break up to where one spouse can contract another marriage with somebody else. Now, let me point out at this point that I said in the beginning that the honorable marriage is not used to legitimatize fornication or adultery. I've already explained to you how a marriage is adulterated. It's when one spouse commits fornication with somebody other than their spouse. That's, it's all fornication. Pornia is the Greek word. But to have an adulterous marriage, you would have to be a situation to where fornication is committed by one spouse with somebody else, whether they be married or not. So fornication is a general term. Any illicit sexual behavior outside of marriage. 
But adultery is a specific term when two people are in an honorable marriage and one of them commits fornication with somebody else. In Ezekiel 16, verse 32, we find this. A wife that commits adultery taketh strangers instead of her husband. I think that's about as good of a definition as you can get. Someone strange to the honorable marriage union. That's one reason, I think, in marriage ceremonies that we ought to try to make them as scripturally binding as we can. Now, what do I mean by that? Saying the things in those ceremonies that remind everybody gathered there, this is not something man to tamper with. We're dealing here with what God has set up. And these two that have come today to be joined together as husband and wife have not only a promise and a vow made to one another, but they're also saying that before God Almighty who will join them together. Now think about this for a moment as to the definition of adultery as I read it from Ezekiel 16.32. A wife that committeth adultery taketh strangers instead of her husband. In Romans 7 and verse 3, Paul writes, So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So it's obvious uh, Marriage remains until, as we say in the ceremony, death do them part. Now, the people of Jesus' day, many of them, were seeking to legitimize adultery. And they were trying to do it through marriage. So one reason the question was raised in Matthew 19 and put to Jesus. Jesus did not tolerate it at all. Matthew 5, verses 31 and 32, we find these words. It hath been said... Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, Jesus speaking, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, cause of her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. They have no reason, scriptural reason, to destroy that honorable God joined marriage so when they go and try to contract another marriage when that one is still binding then adultery enters in in Luke 16 18 whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery you have the general law laid out but we must as we say most often take all of what the Bible says on a matter before we draw our final conclusion. And we find in Matthew 19, 9, and I say unto you, the Greek actually says, but I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife. Now here's a clause of exception, which means if and only if, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now let me bring this down to what I said a while ago as we go out under the Great Commission striving to convert people to Christ. If people are in that situation, there's no way in the world they can remain in that situation and become a Christian like we read of the New Testament. They must repent of all sins and come out of those things. Our baptism won't do anybody any good. Baptism does one thing to the believer who repents of his or her sins and confesses faith in Christ, it remits their past sins. That is all that it does as far as sin is concerned. One is baptized into Christ. It doesn't become a divorce court. It doesn't become a marriage ceremony. It doesn't take the place once you are raised from the watery grave of baptism and added to the church by the Lord Himself. It doesn't take the place, I say, of worshiping God acceptably, of studying your Bible, of prayer, 
All those things are enjoined upon us to be faithful as a Christian. But in becoming a Christian, we must repent of all previous sins. And if a person is in an adulterous union, they can't stay in it. Why is a person a fornicator? Because they commit fornication. You baptize that person. The person continues to commit fornication. I simply ask, what is he? He's a fornicator. But he's been baptized. Well, obviously, if he continues on, he hasn't repented. Paul said to the church at Rome in Romans 6, Shall we continue? That's a state unabated, not interrupted. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, I'm talking about sin. I debated a fellow one time, and I said, uh, he says that concerning what Paul asks, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, yes. Just be baptized, and you can stay right in that state. Paul said, God forbid. Greek means may it never be so. You're a new creature in Christ because you died to your old way, which was sinful. That's what repentance does. And you bring forth fruits worthy or suitable for repentance. That means you leave all that's wrong. And you resolve for the rest of your life, when you see anything in your life, contrary to the will of heaven, you leave it. That's the significance of repentance in the plan of salvation. Well, you can see how that doesn't fit too well in our nation today. And you can see why it is so tempting for churches to let down their guard and to say, well, they said they were sorry. Sorry is not repentance in and of itself alone. It is a breaking down of the old stubborn will, the seat of all sin and rebellion against God, and accepting God on his terms without equivocation. So neither does the Bible recognize same-sex marriages as anything but what? Fornication, but it's even worse. It's unnatural fornication. When a man and a woman commit fornication, that's natural. But when a man and a man or a woman and a woman, that's unnatural. And that's one reason it is looked down on as it is in God's Word. Read Romans chapter 1 and believe it. Romans 1, 26 and 27, for this cause... God gave them up to vile affections. What cause? They didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. Well, if you don't retain His Word in your knowledge, you don't want to retain God in your knowledge. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet, which means was suitable. You do not sin against God and not suffer the consequences. Either here, but finally and ultimately and eternally at the judgment when you're consigned to hell forevermore. So we note that those who approve of such actions, according to Romans 1.23, though they may not even practice in themselves, but they approve of them. They fall also under God's condemnation. It's very easy to get into the state of affairs and say, well, I'm not going to do anything like that. I would never do something like that. But that other person doing it doesn't really bother me. Truth of the matter is, in a society or a culture, any person who sins hurts everybody else. You may not realize it, but that's true. Paul said it this way, no man liveth to himself. And no man dieth to himself. We all exercise by our actions influence for good or evil over other people. That's why we talk about the Christian example. Notice what he said in Romans 1.23. The King James reads, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. The American Standard Version, 1901, reads, Who knowing the ordinance of God, that they that practice such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, 
but also consent with them that practice them. Here are people that know God's decrees. That those who violate, the, violate those decrees and stay in them are wrong. But they not only do them, but they give their approval of that kind of thing. Now that's what you're hearing all over the land today. Don't judge them. Don't be judgmental. What do you do about John 7, 24? Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And all of God's commandments are righteousness. Psalms 119, verse 172. We're expected to judge in the light of truth applied to the appropriate situations. Jesus said it this way. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. So what do you have when the laws of the land recognize a marriage that's really based upon lust and adultery and fornication? Well, you have a marriage that God does not honor. You have a marriage that is a marriage in name only. And you give mere lip service to the word marriage. And you're debasing that which God calls holy and makes holy. There's only one way for me to be holy, for you to be holy in anything we do. That's to live in harmony with God's will. And we're taught to be holy even as God's holy. How can that be? Jesus made it possible. Jesus came and as the Lamb of God was tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. Thus he could go to the cross, die an innocent person on the cross, satisfy God judgment and thus offer salvation through faith and obedience to his gospel God's power to save Romans 1 16 which the church is to preach to the whole world and which includes these truths on marriage divorce and remarriage that's what you do there is no other way your family may not want to deal with you because you take that stand the government could get after you People at work may not like you. That doesn't make any difference. It's the church's obligation to teach the truth in all things. So our goal, and that's all that we have in life to do, is to honor God. To honor God in all things. And that includes marriage and the home is set out on the pages of the Bible. There's only one way you can do that. Whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. That's what we have written up above here. We are to act as the authority of Jesus Christ, who has all authority in heaven and earth, teaches us to act in His last will and testament. Now, much more could be said about what I've said today, and you may have certain questions about it, and if you do, let me know. We'll deal with them specifically. I didn't intend to deal with every little bitty thing that might come to mind, but to set out the general teaching of the Bible concerning what is an honorable marriage from God's perspective. If you're not a Christian today, we urge you to receive the truth of God concerning one becoming a Christian. And on the basis of the teaching of the Scriptures, Romans 10, 17, to believe in Christ with all your heart, to obey the scriptures when it says we must repent of our sins, Acts 17.30. Then to confess our faith in Christ, the Son of God, Romans 10.10. 10. Now you're a scriptural candidate to be baptized in Christ, immersed in water by the authority of Christ, to obtain the remission and forgiveness of sins. God's the offended party. We're the offenders. God must forgive us of our sins. He does so when we are contrite of heart, and when we receive with meekness the engrafted word and abide by it. Remember that we're to keep God, keep God's commandments, for that's the whole duty of man. If you need to obey the gospel, now is the time to do that. As a child of God, you still live like the New Testament says Christians are to live. And if you haven't done that, or if you slipped away, we urge you to repent, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness. Listen to the words of this song. Think seriously about how brief and uncertain life is and obey the gospel today while you have a chance.
resolving to live for the Lord as long as you're on this earth. Find the courage and the love of God to do that. And think for a moment. If you'd rise up and obey the gospel, look what an example you would set for others that need to do the same thing. Not only saving your soul, but encouraging them to become Christians. That heaven someday, if you're faithful, will be your home. If you're subject to the blessed call of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.